We're going to use very careful language while talking about peptides because remember that Western medicine has written all these off. Um, even though these are synthetic versions of naturally occurring substances, right? So for all of the peptide therapy we talk about, it's, it's not a drug. It, it's, it's, they, didn't, they didn't take it from a person, but it's something that exists already in you. And because a peptide is just a chain of amino acids, you can sequence the amino acid chain very easily. Like the creation of peptides is, is not reinventing the wheel. All righty, we ready? Yep. Okay. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of The Zero Downside with Dr. Wade McKenna. Dr. McKenna is an orthopedic trained trauma surgeon who's applied biologics to his surgical procedures to kind of introduce a new non-invasive way of medicine. Today, one of our topics we're going to go into is about peptides for inflammation. So if you are looking for the best peptides to help with your inflammatory concerns, this episode is perfect for you. We're going to try to wrap this up all night and bundled for you to always reference and go check out our other episodes if there's anything you want further information about because we have plenty of them. All right, so I'm going to let Mike introduce himself real quick. So he'll also be assisting me with these interview questions. Absolutely, Hannah. Thank you so much. As always, uh, welcome to the Zero Downside podcast. We're very excited to uh, address this in a very target specific way to talk about peptides and, and uses. We've had a lot of success uh, within the practice in, in utilizing peptides. And this is something that Dr. McKenna has been very familiar with for quite some time. So we're excited to uh, get his thoughts on that and looking forward to the conversation. I can't believe that Mike didn't start off with a big regulatory talk um, because um, the first thing that he said when, um, when Hannah wanted to talk about uh, revisit some of the peptide information because she's the one on the front end answering a lot of questions from patients, the first thing Mike said is, remember, these are all Schedule two. Right. And, and category two, category yes, two. Yes. So, so and category two is different. Schedule two is more for the narcotics. Category two just means the FDA banned them all. Um, but the FDA doesn't. And I'm going to be really careful with the way now, I'm I watching now. A now, lot yeah. of uh, I got Mike setting up straight. That, that's a good <laughs> sign. Um, I'm going to be really careful with the way we use language and words because words matter. Um, but we're going to use very careful language while talking about peptides because remember that Western medicine has written all these off. Um, even though these are synthetic versions of naturally occurring substances, right? So for all of the peptide therapy we talk about, it's, it's not a drug. It, it's, it's, they didn't, they didn't take it from a person, but it's something that exists already in you. And because a peptide is just a chain of amino acids, you can sequence the amino acid chain very easily. Like the creation of peptides is, is not reinventing the wheel if you have very basic compound pharmacy setup. You can sequence amino acids in the way that God has already done that in the human body. And then it's just about what are the function and purpose of different amino acid chains, peptides, uh, in the human body. And when it comes to the way we're going to word some of this, it's going to sound like we're really endorsing the use of some of these. And we, doctor patient, can have significant discussions over the use of certain peptide therapy. On the podcast, what we're going to try to do is this is for information purposes, and we're going to try to give you some very specific um, information from a doctor um, that is um, 
have the appropriate paperwork uh, on on the wall uh, to show that I am probably qualified to have this mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly qualified to have this discussion with a patient who we are talking about potential regenerative, non-traditional pharmacologic solutions for. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. it, Fair. It's, um, it's a lot of words to say that what the the doctor patient relationship is not governed by the FDA. You have to be a doctor to practice medicine. Now, you don't have to be a doctor to recommend um, supplements. Now, the problem with that is most traditional medicine physicians will not recommend a supplement because apparently nutrition and what you put in your mouth and stomach and your gut isn't important. Um, because we have physicians all the time tell patients, and I'm going to hammer this home until someone quotes me on it in the office, is that because patients say it all the time, that a physician has told them that all vitamins do is give you expensive urine. And that is the most ridiculous comment in the world at a time where most of the walking wounded are, if, if you measure their D3 levels, you're going to see their vitamin D deficient. And vitamin D deficiency is just a really good overall marker of your immune function. And so taking some supplements to augment your own immune function and get your body up to speed is kind of like putting better quality gasoline in the car. Right? There are a lot of high performance cars mm -hmm. that literally say, don't use the bad gas. Mm -hmm. Right? Pay for the higher octane fuel. Mm -hmm. If you're driving a rental car, do you pay for the higher octane fuel? No, I don't, right? Like, I'm driving a rental car right now. I'm not putting premium gasoline in the rental car. Mm. But I don't want to treat this like a rental car, yeah. right? <laughs> that, I, I mean, yes. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's think about it that way, right? Like, yeah. like, like, I would never, you know, there's all these rental cars now come to market to buy. Would you buy a rental car? Like, I rented a car, and I'm a 60-year-old male, and I don't deserve nice things. We make the argument all the time. I don't deserve nice things because I don't take care of stuff. I, 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 I'm, I'm usually, I'm, I'm an acquired taste for sure because, because I, I spend my time thinking about a lot of other things other than changing the oil in the, like I don't have any toys anymore. Like I have a motorcycle, so the, but, but that's pretty low maintenance motorcycle, right? Like I don't, I don't have to take the plugs out. I don't have to check the points. I don't have to do like I have to make sure it's on a trickle charger so I can start it. Let's let's focus on not treating this like it's mm -hmm. something in the garage that you don't take care of, right? So if we're gonna do that, guess what peptides could be? Mm -hmm. A way to up the octane of the gasoline, mm -hmm. right? How do we how do we micro regulate? How did how, how does the body, how does nature micro regulate all these histochemical processes in your body? Peptides, mm -hmm. right? Peptides that become ligands and and big big hormone chains and the the reductase, the way to get rid of a signaling hormone or a signaling peptide is also a peptide because it's one peptide that gets rid of something, one peptide that activates something. It's very detailed change. Are there ways to augment and make those perform better? Sure. Are these peptides some big mystery that's hidden from Western medicine? No. A lot of these peptides especially some of the ones we'll talk about specifically. So some of the questions we get in clinic and, and I think is how to regulate overall inflammatory load and healing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, because some people say that this peptides could be an alternative to opioids, essentially. Oh. So how? Oh, <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Big Pharma not going to like that, right? Well, you can't patent a peptide, but you can patent an opioid. Well, you so can, that's... And, and not only that, you can even with patenting the delivery method and the dosing schedule, get a peptide covered as a drug. Like, that's the greatest sham in the history of the world. You're saying make a pen where the dose doesn't matter on reimbursement to? You mean like some of the most popular drugs on the market right now where they didn't patent the peptide because it's a synthetic version of a naturally occurring substance. So God owns that IP, <laughs> not Pfizer. Right. Or, or one of those big drug companies. Right. So there are dosing pen and you get four pins a month and you do a little sub Q injection. And it doesn't matter if that dose is the 
0.25 milligram dose, the 0.5 milligram dose, the one milligram dose, the two and a half milligram dose, the cost of your four pins is the same. Now, mm -hmm. I'm just a poor little country kid, but one cow shouldn't cost the same as five, right? Like, I mean, this is kind of a stupid argument with peptide therapy given in the, and, and I'm not gonna say non-traditional way, in the more traditional way, mm -hmm. because there weren't a lot of peptides patented on the drug side, and there are now. Mm -hmm. Peptide therapy traditionally has been a compounding pharmacy, putting together the amino acid chain in the way that's published already in the book, right? Like they, they didn't discover the amino acid chain. So the amino acid chain is readily definitive as what that substance is. And then they make that same substance, put those amino acids in that same order, and now you have a peptide. And some of the peptides that the body uses really well, and my favorite one probably to talk about because I think it's, it just completely unmasks how, how broke Western medicine is, is there's a peptide that's been around for a really long time that, that we have a ton of patients that have exposure to, best way to say that, uh, called BPC-157. And BPC-157 has been named BPC-157 for a really, really long time. Do you know what BPC stands for? What does it stand for? Because I know I'm not going to pronounce it right. Body Protection Compound. Oh, definitely not what I thought. Now, <laughs> you made a banned substance out of something that in medicine has been called body protection compound. Do you think <clears throat> when the scientists that named BPC-157, BPC, do you think they named it based on what the body uses it for? Or do you think they just imaginarily assigned it a purpose? Most things in medicine are named based on its purpose and structure and function. Body protection compound. Just let us sink in for a second. Like, if we're going to name something that sounds like it should be really good for you, you, it, you like, if you're going to ban something, it should be labeled, it destroys the body compound, right? Like, harmful body component, <laughs> right? Like, HBC, harmful body compound, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not. It, it's, it's called body protection compound. It's, it's, it's produced in the gut. It protects your, your, your systemic inflammatory load, helps regulate and break down cytokines, and can be really used effectively in pain and to alleviate the, inf the pain that's secondary to inflammation as a neuromodulator. And that's what the body would do with it. Now, there's some really good research that's not anecdotal after thousands of cases um, that when you inject it closer to the side of pain, it's a very easy subcutaneous injection, just like a diabetic would give himself. It's a 31 gauge needle, but it's not, you don't go get it from a pharmacy in four little pens that they charge you for the pen and the dosing schedule. A compounder, the way traditional peptide therapy work is a doctor writes you a prescription or recommends a research lab for you to obtain the component from. And then they tell you how much you should use based on what your symptoms are because there's not an exact amount for everybody there's not some magic dose that works for everyone and that's and just because these are the components that would help you do that in nature doesn't mean you'll see a big big enough difference to make it worthwhile for some things but it certainly means that the downside of the administration of that is is very minimal right so when people talk about, well, why are peptides banned? That's a really, really good question. Because yeah. category two is, and, and by the FDA's own guidance, and you can refer back. So we, we did a whole episode on some of the, the common peptide therapy. And then about two months later, the FDA put all these great peptides that have been used in medicine for years into, into category two. And the only guidance from the FDA on why they're banned, regardless of what we are, because I just got done looking it up. 
on Medline and Helpline and, on, and just a general search on three different browsers. All of them talk about, because you can enter, is this harmful? Is this safe? Is this, and you know what all of them say? Well, there's not enough safety and efficacy data. It could be harmful. Okay, why, why do you need safety and efficacy data on something your body already produces and we've delineated is crucial in the steps to healing, lowering your inflammatory load, keeping your muscle mass, getting your IGF-1 levels up, like I'm just, uh, healthy collagen restoration. I'm just going over a lot of the general purposes over a lot of the peptides. Collagen, inflammation, pain, gut health, restoring metabolic function, getting rid of insulin resistance. Those are the purposes of a lot of the peptides that, that, that a physician might recommend to you. And if you look them up on the internet and you're not on DuckDuckGo or Brave or a Tor server, it says safety and efficacy data is not provided. Well, that's, that's just not true. There's plenty of papers written on it. What the FDA's guidance, but everyone's afraid to talk about it because you'll get canceled. This episode might not even stay up. Hannah will have to post it four times. Um, because what the FDA said is we're making them schedule two because of the potential contamination in bulk source components. That was their only guidance. Not that they're bad. Not that there's any data to show they hurt someone. Right. And yeah, don't get me started on that line of it. Right. Because that's so, so you just like, oh, well, you know, I took them and I got cancer. No, I took them and I got heart failure. No, I took them and I had myocarditis. No, I took them and I had immune failure. No. Now, there is something that they've recommended everyone take that those are actually listed side effects on the profile for now through the VIRS data, but it's not a peptide. Right. The great, the, the great myth, now, will peptides help detoxify you after you've taken the substance that they tried to jab into everybody? Probably, right? Because you can lower someone's immune overreaction to things it didn't need to overreact to. You can maintain better muscle mass. You can keep your hair. You can modulate the amount of collagen turnover in the skin. So GHKCU, copper peptide really well published, and we talked about it in the hair episode, right? That, that GHKCU has been published in, in, for follicular stabilization and health in the skin, going back to rat studies in the early 2000s, late 90s, right? You've been a huge fan of GHK, GHK copper. Really yeah, yeah, copper, GHKCU, yeah. so copper peptide. Yes. So do I think that that copper peptide hurts anyone? No, you know why? Because it's a naturally occurring peptide. Right. It just starts to go down over time a as you get older. And that's, but when you have higher levels of GHKC, you know what you have? Younger looking skin, healthier looking hair. Decrease in inflammation. Decrease in the inflammatory load. Inflammation is really, really complicated. And Hannah is, is like, which ones are anti-inflammatory? Which ones are pain? Well, a lot of Kind of all of them. Yeah. Right. Because guess what is, nor what, guess what you need to, to have blood supply and heal? Decreased loads of inflammatory response and better collagen deposition, better microangiogenesis, which is blood flow, right? So is there, an inner, is there a purpose of TB500? Oh, TB500, well, the, the weightlifters use it. It's thymosin, right? It is a, it's secreted by the thymus. The thalamic gland in the human body is really important. Mm -hmm. And what does it do? Um, it has a significant role in the downgrading of inflammatory change, has a significant role in the upgrading of the enzymes that help you get rid of the inflammatory cycle. It modulates cytokine function. Oh, and you know what a T lymphocyte, where those come from? Thymus. You know what that's really important in? Immune function, right? So you might see immune modulation microangiogenesis, decrease in inflammatory load, make it easier. Does it build muscle? I wouldn't make that claim. But if you aren't inflamed and you have better microangiogenesis and you turn over and store your collagen better, might it be easier to recover from a workout? I think that data, if you search that specifically, not on the traditional forms of mass media, you're going to find out there are really good articles 
published to show that that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that you'll find the same thing with BPC-157. I'm, I'm, I literally think I'm just going to start calling it body protection compound 157 because it makes the narrative against it sound so silly, right? Um, BPC sounds like some experimental terminator drug, right? Oh, I'm going to, like we're, I call my daughter, no, she'll hate this, but her, I call her the tessellator because she's because she's just so dominant, you know, and has been her whole, like a five-year-old soccer. She's just, ah, right. And so she's got that, that killer instinct on, on, and she's like the calmest, night nicest, genteel kid until you get her involved in something competitive in sports. And she, she, you know, it's just like the term it's game on. So I call her test later <clears throat> and she hates it. But especially if I scream it at a game, I can watch her performance level go up because she's just mad at me. I'm fine with that. Right. Like get mad at dad. But that that's what BPC should be called, like something that just BPC-157. Sounds like if Schwarzenegger says it, it sounds dangerous. Yeah. If you call it body protection compound, it kind of makes it seem stupid to even discuss, is this good for me? Mm -hmm. Scientists 20 years ago, or longer actually, named it body protection compound. Does it sound bad for you? No, right? It's like, I think that we're probably good. So between TB500, thymosin, beta, four and five, like different, like there's versions, but it's thymosin. And the thalamic gland and thymosin is really important. JHKCU, do you, can you have healthy hair, collagen deposition, all that without it? Not really, right? Does your body make it? Yeah. Do you need to augment it and supplement it sometimes to improve your result with whatever you're trying to accomplish? Yeah. So something I'm curious about when, when it comes to joint pain, you know, and you've got TB500 or TB4, whatever we're referring to it as GHK copper, and then you've got body protection compound 157, right? We're done. It's done. Today is day one of, of that vernacular. That. I, so, I just want to strip the narrative off of this I got stuff being it. I got so you. dangerous that <laughs> the guys in the lab use it. And it's like anabolic steroids. No, actually, TB thymosin beta has been shown to not affect the adrenal cortical steroid axis of the adrenal glands. Unlike most of the compounds that your doctor is going to inject in your joint. Right. Right. So way healthier for you than, than the traditional approach of having a cortical steroid injected that can suppress your adrenal cortical steroid, the loop. Right. So that, that perfectly leads me into the question is for joint pain. You know, you've got a patient, Hannah's called you on and says, hey, you know, they're asking about what peptides to take for joint pain. How do you as as the physician with all these tools in the tool belt, right? You've got all the fun toys and that includes thymus and that includes GHK copper and BPC 157 body protection compound yeah. 157. How do you pick which one? 1295. Right. How do you how do you as the chef in the kitchen take all those ingredients and decide which ones are best for ligament pain or tendon pain or tendonitis or uh, well, post-operative? Uh, here's, here's, here's where peptides could be inappropriately used. When they're used indiscriminately without, without regard to what's going on in a patient, yeah. right? Because if you do the lab and we know what your goals are, like I need to know what's broken in you before I know what to fix. Yeah. Right. Well, it's your vitamin question. Which vitamin do you prescribe for that patient? I love that question because I've go. never had a medical student get it right ever. Yeah. I've never had a doctor get it right ever. And I have had some hour-long answers to that question. What is the most important vitamin to tell a patient to take? And I've had hour-long answers to that question. I mean, Hannah's head would have exploded, right? You ask someone that question, well, I think if you make the argument for No, you know what? It's the one the patient's deficient in. Like so the, the same one. can be said for peptides. Same for peptides, right? What is the problem? Where's the feedback loop getting wrong? What, where's the inflammatory source? Where are you hurt? What's happened to, uh, have you affected the blood supply to that area with chronic trauma? Do you have other metabolic dis dysfunction? Is, are, are you overworking the right muscle groups with the way you work out? We need to help you do some things to balance that out. Like lab, physical exam, and a history is kind of how I would help a patient navigate the storm on what things could help them and what things would be a waste of time. And then after you do that, you know what you do to see if it helped? You do follow up and you say, hey, how are you feeling when you do this? What happens when you do this? Like it's about the medical management, not, hey, go take this. That, that, do I think that's a very, look, and here's the only problem with, with that. It, unlike 
unlike the pharmacopoeia of Western medicine, at least patients aren't going to get hurt. Fair. Some of them could just waste money. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> I'd rather you not even waste money, let alone do something that might not optimize your overall function. Right. So when we talk about peptide therapy, it's about is there a way without breaking the bank or without doing something that's harmful or without creating a bigger hurdle and wall for you to navigate through? Is there some things we can do to help you navigate the storm? We say all the time, the stem cell from bone marrow, there's 7,000 naturally occurring peptides in the human body. For me to treat you or recommend peptide therapy for someone, I need to know what your goals are, where you're at function-wise, what else is going on, what your hormone levels look like, how's your thyroid working. I need to know some things like that. Does the stem cell have all that information at its disposal when it's secreting those peptides for you? Yeah, right? Like I, if, you, if you're injecting bone marrow aspirate concentrate in a certain area of a human body that's had pain, inflammation, swelling, failure to heal, I don't have to tell it what peptides to secrete. Are there some hacks to get through that sometimes? And are those, do those, are those contraindicated in patients that are getting bone marrow aspirate concentrate or PRP injected into areas of pain? No, they augment and support the function of the biologics that we're recommending because peptide therapies are biologics. They are synthetic copies of something that naturally exists. It's not a drug. It's a peptide, which is just an amino acid chain, short of being a protein. Proteins are longer amino acid chains or ligands or hormones, but they're all based on amino acid therapy, right? You know, when I first got into peptides, and it's been some time, it was all online, right? You heard somebody at a gym, you know, you get injured, you feel like your pec gets tight and a guy walks up to you at the gym bag and out comes this bottle of BPC-157. And and there's just so much in there. And the, the issue is, is that with the category two classification now, we've kind of reverted backwards Which scientifically. Is very purposeful, yes. And, and so the, the main concern of the FDA was, hey, we want to make sure these things are safe and it's solid efficacy in use. That but wasn't the main concern of the FDA. Agreed. That's what they published. <laughs> that's but, what they th what they said was we're just worried yeah. that they could be contaminated. Well the the points that you're making today are it's more of a regulation on compound and pharmacy. Yes. Right? Correct. Because these weren't brand names. Yes. Right. This is like trying to make generics against the law. Agreed. Right. So uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. But, no, you're but fine. I think that you're any fine. time that because it almost sounded like so this is the reason I can't listen to the podcast. Because some of the sarcasm's lost. Like it almost sounded like. You mean you have to watch the podcast? Yeah, because yeah, I, can, yeah, I, was like, I was like, well, like there we go. Watch there it we on, go. On Doesn't YouTube, listen right? to anything. Like, I can't listen to it. Like, yeah. If I'm if I'm you know taking a walk, listen on Spotify. There's things I've said like, well, we all know the FDA has your best interests at heart. But in my on the podcast, on, visually I'm like, no, right? Like, like I literally get the get the get the the you know the redheaded head roll thing going. And, and no, that's not what I said, but that's what I said, right? It's like, you said, well, the FDA said, so don't misquote Mike ever and make him sound like he was defending the FDA's protocol not on, on, on the regulation of peptide therapy. He was trying to quote what their narrative would be so that we can defend against it. But, but now I'll let you finish to, your No, you're good. To the uh, point Not is, that I'm protecting compound pharmacists for any profound reason other than they usually have the patient's interest at heart a lot more than the companies that make most drugs do. Fair. And to your point, yes, it's the compound pharmacies under the microscope. The point I was making was early on, the research was self-sustained, right? Everything I learned about peptides, I had to research myself, whether it was on Reddit or on DuckDuckGo or a Tor browser or anything like that. The main thing is the importance of the practitioner. Right. And that the onus still falls on you, because just like you said, I can walk into a Sprouts or Costco, CVS, wherever I can look at a shelf full of vitamins and I can go, well, vitamin D sure sounds good. I'm taking that one. And I could be medically metabolically broken where it's not that 
that vitamin that I'm deficient in. So now I've taken a vitamin that's not harmful, but it didn't help, right? It didn't fix the root issue. So with you and peptides, and I think to Hannah's point at the beginning of the episode, the importance is this. It is absolutely crucial to find someone that understands the human body the metabolic use of these compounds. The reason for each peptide is BPC-157. If I ordered it through a website in Germany, going to hurt me. Probably not as long maybe as the not. vials clean. Yeah, maybe not. Right. Which is why we select very carefully Stored which research pharmacies we use. Correct. Source but, from for source source from appropriate yes. component. But the value of of the education and the research that you've put into it and to the viewers and the people listening, the, the point that I want to drive home is BPC-157, if it's a clean vial, if you got it from a clean source and you took it, are you going to get hurt? No. Is it what your body needs the most? Maybe. You know, and so yeah, that's maybe. why it's really important to have episodes like this where we can explain to patients that, look, is BPC going to hurt you? No. Is PT-141 going to hurt your, no, your not function hurt at you home? You take too much or you yes. take it wrong. Of course, anything. Look, here's a, let me just look in the camera really quick <laughs> and, and say... Anything can be harmful, harmful if used inappropriately. Correct. Right? If you don't do it right and, you, and you're not a doctor, and look, even if you're a doctor and you don't know what you're doing, right? But if, you're, if, you, if you don't understand the usage and administration of anything, you can hurt yourself. Yeah. Are there people that bleed out from taking too much vitamin E, vitamin C, and they're on ginkgo biloba and five other herbal blood thinners that they didn't know was a blood thinner because they're taking real high-dose vitamin C, which is also a blood thinner, and then they add E, which... Of course, like yeah. they'll fall and bump your head, yeah. right? So anything could be harmful. But that being said, is this a lot safer yeah. than picking up a pill on the floor, not knowing what it's for and not knowing what it is and taking it and seeing what happens? Yeah, that should never be the approach to something you're putting in your body. Yeah. Well, that's why this is important. It's it's also why it's helpful, right? If you want the most bang for your buck to fix deficiencies in the human body, that's why you need to go to somebody that that has sourced the information from good outlets. Oh, maybe right? someone that actually has thousands of patient experiences in navigating the non traditional approach to healing with a patient's best interests at heart and helping them with that. And I think that that's our goal in our clinic is you're not getting medical misinformation when you call my office. You're getting information. Do we have a significant problem keeping some of this up on the internet because someone wants to call it medical misinformation? Well, yeah. Is that person trained at a level that they should be fact-checking a physician that has treated thousands of patients. I, I, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say most of the time, no. Yeah, right? it's not anecdotal data. It, it's, it's, and this <laughs> is not, you know, it, my favorite comment ever is, is, is there are times where something is anecdotal, but after thousands of cases, it's just obvious. Right. And then after thousands of cases and 15 years, then it's just bloody obvious. Right. Yeah. So I, I think that what we're talking about is health maintenance, regenerative health care. I think that we've done a couple great episodes on, uh, on the podcast about peptides, one on just all the regulatory stuff where we were really careful. But I think Hannah had to put that episode up three times and dumb it down and dumb it down and take more and more facts out of it. Um, because, you know, they're fact checking our facts. So facts is the new F word for, for society right now. Like if you say, oh, you can't say the F word. Yeah, it's a fact. Like facts is an F word. Um, but I think when you, even with the hair episode, we talked a lot about JHKCU. You. you know why? Because that's what a lot of research is out there on. Um, Okay, so now we, I, I went on my little rant and we were trying to do a little quick peptide thing. I what think specific, it was, what I, specific questions did I not I get think to? you covered it all, really. And I think we covered all the bases of its application, its mechanisms, and how you've incorporated it in the practice and your deciding factors of which ones go where. And really, you know, all of them have a benefit. Yeah, in there, some there's, way. There, there's certainly a big, mm. like, if you look at, like, if, here's what I'll do when patients say, Patients will look at, especially patients that have knew me two or three years ago, and they'll ask Mike or they'll ask Hannah, what's he doing? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, 
I want to do whatever he did. Yeah. Right? Did my daughter for Christmas buy me a separate mini fridge for my peptides? Because she wants all my bottles out of our refrigerator in the kitchen. Yeah. Does that mean I sh that I use one? Probably not if I have a mini fridge. Right? That's fair. So do I think that sometimes based on what symptoms you're having or how you feel or where you're at metabolically or what kind of a workout you did, can that alter what we would recommend for someone? Yes, because we want to tailor your care. It's the reason we have a full-time family practice guy in our clinic. It's the reason we do hormone panels. It's the reason we do a biologic workup. It's the reason we look at your C-reactive protein, right? So anyway, I, I mean. No, I know, think it's, it's great. It's, it's, this is one of those topics because we have to be so careful and we weren't careful today about the way we describe functionality and use because we're not making a claim. We're talking about what the published mechanisms of action and uses for it would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that about sums and wraps it up and how we have used great peptides as a alternative to prescribing patients on opioids and all the worst stuff. And I hope that you guys got some valuable information out of it. I'm going to let Dr. McKenna do his usual sign off and we'll see you next time. So I'm going I'm to put one 30 second little blip just so you know, there are 40 peptides more that a physician could recommend and help you get access to. Mm -hmm. The cell secretes all of them. But for us to help you obtain the result, we would need to know what you have, what your goals are, right? And there's a lot more peptides than the one you read about on Reddit. Um, and the one that some guy in the gym is going to recommend out of his gym bag that hasn't been stored appropriately. But I think for the most part, the downside is very low. And so again, I, not to ramble, but, but trying to protect the integrity of the show and to make sure we get to continue to do it. Um, we have had some very focused episodes in the past, uh, one about different peptides we recommend, one about the regulatory status, but you'll find out that what we do is integrated and that if you go to the hair episode, you're going to hear us talk about some different peptides. If you go to back pain episode, you're going to hear us talk about different peptides. If you go to rotator cuff episode, you're going to hear us talk about different peptides because we don't isolate our approach to helping you heal. And, and because, because it takes a lot of support and belief from our patients, um, I want to say thank you again for your viewership and belief. And I want to let you know we genuinely appreciate your trust and the opportunity to continue to take care of you. And thank you. Nice job.